I have a green light. Oh, calm down, people. Calm down. <laughs> All right, so let me get this done real quickly for those. How many of you are here for the very first time? Anyone visiting with us for the first time? Right there? I don't want to embarrass you, but I am so glad you're here. Can we give God praise for that visitor right there? I do want to do that. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us this morning. Um, I think over the last few weeks, you have been hearing sermons regarding the one another. How many of you all have been taking that in like a straw in a soda, right? Okay, so I'm going to give you a chance to get your pad and pencils together because I'm going to throw a lot of scripture at you this morning, and I know you're not going to be able to retain it all in your head. So when they come up on the screen, make sure you write it down because the power of God is in his word. And so, oh, my Lord, who said amen? We're already off to a great start. Yeah, yeah. So the power of God is in his word, the good news, the gospel. And so we've been saying over the past few weeks, do the one another's, church, the one another's. And I want to lay a light foundation this morning of what you have to be, what you have to do in order to get the one another's accomplished. What God intends from his word is to have the one, one another's be a lifestyle for us. Uh, how many of you all go to work each day? How many of you all uh, eat each day? It's just become a part of your lifestyle. That's what you do. That's what we do. Well, God wants us to take eternal life, not annually, as we get ready to enter into the Easter season, not monthly, but daily. Let it become a lifestyle. Transform us to a lifestyle. So I'm Pastor Milton. I am not uh, Mark Jeske. I'm not Pastor Bill Jeske. I'm none of those folks. I am Pastor Milton Harding. And it is a privilege to stand before you this morning and bring you God's Word. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Luke chapter 18. And let, just a little heads up, you should have your Bibles. Don't come to church if you don't have your Bibles. And I know some of you are saying, hey, I got my phone here. Yeah, well, this is not text time. <laughs> not that you all would be texting while the sermon is going on, but I'm just saying, let's get those Bibles, let them be the life source for who we are in Christ. Amen? All right, all right. Did I tell you to turn to Luke chapter 18? I've got a lot that I want to present this morning, and please pray for me that I can get it done ah, by the Spirit of God. So when we do the one another's, uh, there is a requirement. We have to love as Jesus loves. We have to love as Jesus loves. If you're saved, if you're a child of God, then he's called you into a kingdom that says to you, love as he loves. And in order to love as he loves, we have to see as he sees. Oh, how many of you all knew before you came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you were pretty jacked up? Me and you, Marty, and Andrew, just the three of us? Yeah, yeah, we were pretty, thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, we were pretty jacked up. Yeah, so, but once we were able to see Jesus, as it says in, as in John chapter 3 and verse 3, uh, Nicodemus visited Jesus, and, and Jesus says, uh, Nick, you must be born again. You have to be born from above in order to see the kingdom of God. It is from the kingdom of God that we live from. Yes, we, we are passing through this land, through this government, but we're citizens of heaven. Man, if I was preaching, that would have been a great place to put an amen. We are citizens of heaven. So we have to live like we're citizens of heaven. All right, all right, here we go. Luke chapter 18. And uh, we're going to start in verse 35. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now, hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. They told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way were sternly telling him to be quiet. But he kept crying out all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. And when he came near, he questioned him, What do you want me to do for you? And he said, Lord, I want to regain my sight. 
And Jesus said to him, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and began following him, glorifying God. And when all the people saw it, they gave praise to God. This is a wonderful passage when you uh, want to do a, uh, uh, an examination of your own heart to see if you're in the faith. Because there's something going on here with a, a, blind, a blind man that should take place in all of our hearts if we're transitioning from darkness to light. And when you transition from darkness, that's that jacked up place you all were before you came to know Jesus. And you transferred from darkness into the light of his son. Once you come into the light, now you see. Amen? In order to see, and I would say this to you, sight, sight is, is not optional. Sight is a requirement for life. If we can't see Jesus, we can't do Jesus. Oh, let me say that again. If we can't see Jesus, we can't do Jesus. So if we don't see Jesus, then we'll all automatically end up doing religious stuff. And if you come into the King's Chapel to just do religious stuff, I'll give you two more weeks. No, 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 no. Get the Word of God in you and let Him transform you to truth, walking in truth. So in order for us to do life, we must have sight. In order for us to love, we must have sight. Because we have to love as Jesus loved us. Remember how jacked up you were? And he says, according to Romans 5, 8, he says, well, when I say you all, I was too. He says, he says, while we were yet still sinners. This is sobering. You need to think about this. While we were still sinners, God demonstrated his love for us. You ever been around any sinners that you withheld the demonstration of God's love? Oh, y'all going to be that crowd? I mean, you know those people in the lunchroom at work, those heathens. Yeah, we kind of sort of forgot what we were, right? We looked into the mirror and forgot what we were. Oh, Lord, let me tell you, when Jesus showed up on my doorstep, and I didn't, I mean, I was living pretty wild. I was living wild and crazy. Anybody ever been there? Thank you, brother. Thank you. I always feel good when there's another hand that goes up. But anyway, it, it, listen, listen. <clears throat> How many of you all think it's wise to shove cocaine up your nose? Okay, <laughs> you all saying that because you're in church. You didn't say that. Well, no, no. So, 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 yeah, at some point in time, it's got to register in your head. You know what? That ain't wise. Well, there's a lot of stuff you do that's not wise when you're in darkness. Yay? Yeah, I put the happy and happy hour in case you're wondering. So I'm not just up here talking. Some of you don't even know what happy hour is. Anyway, so here we go. It takes sight to live with one another, much less do the one another's. It takes sight to love one another and to live with one another, much less just doing the one another's. You can get a teaching, you can get a lesson on doing the one another's, but how do you know when a German chocolate cake tastes good? Um, was that you, Leon? Yeah, Leon, my man. He says, when you eat it. I think Leon said, when you eat it all. No, but here's the deal. Here's the deal. You don't know how good God's word is until you taste it. And the only way you can taste it is when you live it. You, you love that person who's unlovable. Anybody got anybody like that in your life? They're just hard to love. But let me just say this to you. They don't know, but you know. Who's God going to hold you accountable Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. So if we look at this text, we first of all see the condition. It's right there in verse 35. As Jesus was approaching Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. Now, at some point in time, you're going to see yourself in these several verses here. And I want you to just put a little circle, make a little note to yourself. That's why you need a pen and paper. Make a little note to yourself, and you know what you say, that's me. I was blind. I was sitting on the side of the road, out of the thoroughfare of, of Christ, out of the thoroughfare of living Christ. And so that results, defaults me to sitting on the side of the road, stagnant in my spiritual walk, because I'm blind. Sitting on the curb. And what else was 
this blind man doing? That's right. I'm glad you said it. He was begging. That's where we will default ourselves, and we don't see that natural sense of begging in the sense of, you know, give to me. But that's what this blind man was doing. But what happens when you can't spiritually see and you get a heavy dose of that culture? And that culture is not holding back if you've been in it. How many of you think the culture is pretty jacked up? You know how the culture got jacked up? The people in it. The people in it. The culture is fine as long as you can keep people out of it. <laughs> yeah, okay, don't laugh too much now because I'm coming to the church next. Yeah. How many of you think, how many of you think the church can be jacked up sometimes? Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that. Yeah, we got people over here who've never even met people over here. Why? Because this is their world. You're smiling because you know I'm telling the truth. All right, all right, now, this is their world. Now, listen, we never cross over, and we're called to love one another. Okay, okay, okay. So, so, the condition is he's blind, sitting on the curb, and begging. Verse 36, now hearing a crowd going by, he began to inquire what this was. And we find ourselves spiritually there as well. Let me say this to you. Don't depend on the crowd. The crowd will mess you up. In fact, some of you are sitting in here this morning because somebody in the crowd messed you up. And you've been reeling ever since. Oh, just, a little, just a little glimpse in where we're going. Jesus is on the way. Don't get too wrapped around the axle. He's on the way. But no, you ever had that person in your life that just did you wrong? Don't get quiet on me. That's just like saying amen. Because as soon as I say that, that picture of that person comes into your mind. Let me say this to you. Don't waste any time when you get out of church today. Head over to the phone, over to the house, whatever it is. Get it right with them. Yeah, there's no need to have both of you all in bondage. Ooh, Lord. Lord. We're going to just talk then, because that's two amens that's unprompted. Yeah, we're going to just, so, so, so what I'm saying, what I'm saying, we find out the crowd will mess you up sometimes. Don't worry about the cultural crowd, because that's being filled daily with anti-Christ mindset and ideology. So we know that'll mess us up, but let's turn our focus to the church crowd, because those are where our brothers and sisters exist. And when one hurt, we all hurt. When one rejoices. We all rejoice. Amen? That's the connectedness that should take place here in the King's Chapel. I don't know what brought you here, and I don't know where you came from, and I don't even care. But if you come into the pool, this is how we're swimming here. Somebody say amen. And if you don't want to swim or don't know how to swim, that's two different things. We'll teach you how to swim because we're going to swim in God's Word. And once you get into the water, you become a part of the water, and the water becomes a part of you. Once you come here to fellowship, that word fellowship, rich Greek word is koinonia. Koinonia, look it up. It just means for you to care for one another in community. Caring for one another in community. And so we have the condition blind man. We have the crowd, and in verse, uh, the very next verse, 38, they told him, I'm sorry, 37, they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. Ooh, it gets rich here, it gets rich here. And he called out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. I told you I want you to find yourself in these verses right here, because one thing for sure they told him Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. But it didn't register to the man in that way. The blind man said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. You don't make that statement. You don't make that request unless you believe what most Jews believe, the devout ones, I would say, in a very uh, uh, godly way. Jesus is the Messiah. Yeah, that's why he's called son of David. Jesus is the Messiah. So he didn't say, Je remember when Philip found Nathaniel, his brother? He was laying under the tree. And, and remember what Nathaniel said? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? That was his mindset. In other words, Philip said, come see I, we've, the, 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 the Messiah. Come, come, come. And Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Let's fast forward to this blind man. 
When he heard that Jesus from Nazareth was, was passing by, what did he say? Jesus, son of David. See, because he came through the bloodline. Yeah, Jesus was in David's bloodline. Now, you're going to have to spend some time with the Scriptures to figure out all of that out. But nonetheless, he did. Both jo jo Joseph and Mary through the bloodline. David through the bloodline. But this blind man knew something. You see, God has put in all of us the ability to know him. We can look at his creation, and the creation should tell us that he exists, according to Romans. Yeah, you can't figure out why. Uh, um, 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 um. What are those? Uh, trout. Yeah, trout. You can't tell me why trout fish uh, don't spawn on bass eggs. They're all in the sea. Y'all looking at me like I got two heads. But no, no, no. What I'm saying is God has instructed all of his, all of his creation to praise him, to glorify him. That's the design of creation. Guess what? If you're a part of God's creation, raise your hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. To glorify him. To glorify him. And so, and so, we get from the condition to the crowd, and this is the one that's important. The cry. The cry. How many of you all have ever raised a child from diapers and up? Yeah. You know, there are times you can sit in your yard and listen to the children playing outside, and one of them lets out a shriek. They let out a cry. You don't move a muscle. Why? Because you know that cry is not legit. Right? So you just let them keep playing and work it out. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I got four of them. They're all grown adults. Now, they only move those uh, uh, children things up to adult things. They still cry when they're adults. But nonetheless, nonetheless... God listens to the substance of our cry. How many of us have cried out for him like we really need him? Or do we cry out because someone says, you need to cry out to the Lord? Oh, you let a cinder block fall on your foot and no one will have to tell you to say, ouch. So whatever that is that you're going through, whatever the circumstances are, whatever the, 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 the emptiness of your soul is, it's going to match your cry. And more oftentimes, we seek things to satisfy that cry. You understand what I'm saying? We look to drugs, drinking, uh, uh, women, men, uh, 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 jobs, careers. Oh, Lord God, don't get that quiet on me because now you know, I know I'm talking to you. Listen, listen, listen. So we look for everything else to satisfy it. But Jesus is the only one that can he told the woman at the well in John chapter 4, yes, 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 in John chapter 4, you drink that water, you will thirst again. Ah, but if you drink this water, 4.13, John 14, 13, look it up. He says, but if you drink this water, you will never thirst again. He didn't say you will never be thirsty. But what he's saying is, I can quench every thirst you have. Woo! That would have been way past the amen to a hallelujah right there. So we have the condition, we have the crowd, we have the cry. What is the temperature? What is the substance of your cry? We're not just talking about salvation here, but we should be crying out to him. How many of you all are going through some stuff? Amen, thank you. Uh, I went through some stuff. I'm going to go through some more stuff. But um, <laughs> uh, I did a, about two or three months with, with COVID. I'm in post-COVID mode right now because I'm, getting back on my feet, so to speak. But, but that was some stuff. If you've not had COVID, you don't know. You, and I pray to God you never know. Yeah. Mm. My father used to say, the only difference between a major operation and a minor one is a person that's getting it. Yeah, a person that's getting it. Yeah, that's how you can figure it out. But I'm telling you. Um, so anyway, anyway. <clears throat> We go from the condition to the crowd to the cry. And look at the next verse. We land on the cure. Mm. Verse 40. And Jesus stopped and commanded that he be brought to him. When he came near, he questioned him. Now, this is what I was telling you about the cry. If your cry is legit, it will stop Jesus in his tracks. Because he knows his child's 
He knows when his child needs him. And have you ever been through those moments and times you feel like he's not there? But yet you got the wettest diaper on you ever had on in life. Yeah, you know, you're going through some stuff. And you went, and, and so, 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 just be comforted. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Lo, I'm with you always to the end. And do you know how powerful his silence is? Ooh, do you know how powerful his silence is? When our flesh our, our, squirms. And you know, this is what God does. He doesn't show up <laughs> until the moment that he's needed. Mm. Jeremiah 30 says, 16 rather, he says, he longs, he's full of compassion, and he longs to bestow that loving kindness on us. And when he hears our cry, boom, check your cry out, because the cry will certainly bring the cure. That's a guarantee. Listen, listen. Verse 41, look at what Jesus says. What do you want me to do for you? And he says, Lord, I want to regain my sight. Jesus takes time to ask the blind man, what do you want me to do for you? Remember in verse 35, we find the blind man, blind man on the curb. He has a lifestyle of seeking alms, of begging. So Jesus asked, I mean, the, the blind man said, hey, if you could just let me hold a couple of pennies here till, till Tuesday. But he didn't. He says, I want to regain my sight, which means at some point in time, unlike the blind man who was born blind from birth, at some point in time, he could see, as such as some of you all in here. You, you have seen Jesus, but somewhere along the way, you let the circumstances arrest you. Oh, I rolled up into Farrakhs Hospital, and, and uh, they put that little thing up my nose, and uh, they said, well, you've tested positive. Now, I was pretty much out of it at the time when they did that, but okay, I'm tested positive. And then the next thing they did is roll me into a bedroom, which I spent uh, a few days in. A few is a relative term. And, um, <clears throat> and then I heard the voice of the Lord say this to me. I want to say this to you. Those of you who are going through not COVID, but you're going through a trial. If that's you, raise your hand because I want to speak directly to your heart. I appreciate it. Listen, listen to this. Here's what he said to me. My son, you do have COVID, but COVID doesn't have you. You don't know how long you can roll on that comfort. You do have COVID. You do have that trial. COVID's nothing but a trial. You're wondering why you haven't gotten COVID. Don't worry about COVID. You got something. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, so, so Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And he says, Lord, I want to regain my sight. And Jesus said to him, verse 42, ah, which is the cure, receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. See, some of us are not inflicted in the physical element of our lives. Oh, some of us need to be restored mentally and spiritually, emotionally. Oh, listen, listen, listen. Let me give you another little nugget here. How many of you all have emotions? Seven people? <laughs> what, the rest, what the rest of you people got? <laughs> okay, listen, listen. I don't know how to work with that stuff. Okay, listen, listen. Let me tell you something. When, when Christ comes and he abides with us in us, in our spirit, forget about this outward flesh here, in our soul, we belong to him. He belongs to us. We have this relationship. When he gets in us, he doesn't sit there apart from emotions. He doesn't sit there apart from our thoughts. He doesn't sit there apart from our words. He doesn't sit there apart from our decision-making. No, he permeates all of that. So that here's the call. Discipline yourself to invest time to edify your emotions and your thoughts and your decision-making. But what you say, well, Pastor Melton, how do I do that? The power is where? In the Word of God. Oh, Israel was traveling, and they were under many types of distresses, and he sent his word and delivered him, them from them all. 
You see, it's not always in the physical element that we're dealing with. We just need to be healed up here or in here. Somebody say amen if you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, uh, uh, little Johnny isn't trying to act jacked up. He just needs to have his house rearranged. You, you, are you hearing me what I'm saying now? So, 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 and the Word of God will do just that. Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Look at verse 43. In 35, we see a blind man sitting on the curb begging out. In verse 43, we find out that immediately, I love the usage of, 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 of uh, my brother Luke for using that word. Immediately, it's a, normally, it's a mark word. But he said immediately he regained his sight. Now, this is what should happen after we regain our sight. This is what should happen after we see Jesus. Don't tell me you saw Jesus and then go back sitting on the curb again. He says immediately he began to follow Christ. Ooh. Now, he didn't just follow Christ. He says he was glorifying God. And guess what that lifestyle impacted? How about the people around them? They began to do what? Oh, I wish I could get the church folks to stop thinking about the church folks only. We are supposed to love one another. But that love, look, 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 look. John 13, 34, 35, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, love one another. By this shall men know that you are my disciples. That's something we ought to be able to discover in here. Why? Not because we see people serving, or not because we see this or see that or see that, but because we're loving one another. Oh, I pray that before you leave and in the fellowship time, before you leave today, you'll find somebody to love that you never, ever, knew, ever, knew, ever knew before, and that you would just spend a little moment. And listen, when you go, prepare yourself to be thrown up on. That can happen. Don't ask them how they're doing if you're not willing to be a welcome man. Because the world we live in today, that's got a, a large possibility to happen. People are hurting. Some of you in here are hurting. But somebody's got to know that. I'm giving you permission today. Throw up on somebody if you need to. I've already prepared them that you're coming. Throw up on them and let them love you in Christ. Let them embrace you. As the praise team comes, I want to leave these last few words with you. And please write this down so if you don't remember anything else, you'll remember this. So why is this sight thing so important? Why does he even give us sight? As I told you in John 3, 3, he told Nicodemus, in order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. So he gives us sight to see. You see how easy that was? He gave us sight to see. Well, why does he want us to see? So that we can step? Yeah. He says, follow me. In order to follow him, that means your soul has to take steps to follow him. Ah, oh, he gives us sight to see. Seeing to step. And why does he want us to step? so that we might serve. John 12, 26, Jesus says, He who desires to serve me must follow me. Don't be a long range out here volunteering. Be a child of the kingdom of God, serving. Which means we have to follow Jesus. And why does he want us to serve him? Remember, you're serving him. He wants us to serve him so that we might save others. Let's bow our heads. Father God, we do thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord God, that even today, even right now, you are causing your children to see. And Father, I pray that as you have etched it out in your word, as your Holy Spirit speaks it, that sight is for them to love one another. So we thank you, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Amen.